John, thank you very much for agreeing to a second conversation, this time in Australia. Uh, last time we talked in New York. And you've been here talking about uh, your latest book, The Coddling of the American Mind. I want to say up front now, I'm going to hold it up in front of the camera, this ought to be on everybody's Christmas list this year. I think it's superb. It goes to the heart of the challenges we're facing socially and therefore in terms of economic and uh, political freedom going into the future. It's beautifully accessible. Two points up front. Um, one would be neither of us want to sound like we're anti-young people. We're actually on their side. We think the problem is that we're giving them a bad set of rules to live by. And the second point is that I'd love to explore a bit is that you've been very frank in warning us that our very freedoms are at risk since you've been in, at, uh, here in Australia. So, well, well, thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be talking with you again. Uh, when we talked uh, in New York last time, I was just finishing up the book um, and we spoke mostly about my previous work on moral psychology. Um, my first book was actually called The Happiness Hypothesis, Finding Modern Truth in Ancient Wisdom. It was about 10 ancient ideas. And what's been going on in the United States, at least, is it's as though some people read my first book on ancient wisdom and then decided to do exactly the opposite of what the ancients recommend. And so uh, this book, The Coddling of the American Mind, uh, the subtitle is How uh, Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. Um, we've been teaching young people some very bad ideas. Uh, it certainly isn't their fault. Uh, but I think we should probably start with what's wrong. Um, in the book, we, we, we say people shouldn't catastrophize, but yet we are, Greg Lukianoff and I are in a way catastrophizing because we think something very serious is happening, which is that kids born after 1995, uh, which in other words, Gen Z or Gen Z here in Australia, you might say, um, Gen Z has extraordinarily high rates of anxiety, yep. depression, self-harm and suicide. Yep much higher than kids who were born just three or four years earlier. And so there is a mental health crisis. Um, people all over America, Britain, Canada, Australia yes. see this. Uh, and so the book is, it turns out, while it started with what's going wrong on American campuses, it turned into what did we do to Generation Z? What is going on with them that they have such high rates of, of uh, mental disorders? And one thing I'll say up front, is that one of the best things I found about Gen Z is that they're not in denial at all. They see that their generation has problems. They understand that those problems are intimately tied up with the move of social life from normal interaction to online or social media interaction. And so this is the puzzle we have to unpack. What happened, why, and what do we do about it? Just talk to Jonathan, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs in Great Britain. He makes the same point uh, that he thinks, I think he finds it's fair to say some hope in the fact that uh, those young people are so realistic about the situation they find themselves in. And as you say, it's in the data. Sometimes I meet young people who say, look, everything's going terrifically and all the rest of it, but it's in the data. It's not going well. No, that's right. So let's, let's, let's frame this discussion in the broader context uh, in which overall on this planet for our species, things are generally going well. Poverty is declining, prosperity is rising. So Steven Pinker has two books about how the broad trends are good, how people have for centuries or millennia overplayed the negative, they've been too pessimistic. And I've got to admit he's right about that overall. But as you say, it's in the data. And so in chapter seven of the book, we go into the data on mental health and it's just stunning. Yeah. It's not a small effect. If you trace out levels of depression or anxiety in American teenagers, it's fairly steady. Girls have higher rates than boys, especially the gap opens up around puberty. Girls have higher rates than boys, but in, for both, both sexes, the numbers bounce along until right around 2012, 2013, and then suddenly the boys go up and the girls go way up. And that's true for depression and anxiety, nothing else. So it's not as though they just suddenly are happy talking about uh, things. They're not. They're not suddenly loosening up diagnostic criteria and saying, oh, I have schizophrenia. Oh, I have bipolar disorder. No, it's only anxiety and depression. The rates are way up for girls. And if you look at younger girls, the, teen, the preteens, 11 to 14, that's where you often see increases more than 100%. The rate of self-harm, the rate at which preteen girls are hospitalized because they cut themselves deliberately is up 189%. 
in the United States, uh, similar sorts of data in Britain, Canada, uh, Australia. I haven't found the self-harm data, but anecdotally it's happening. And I, it's I, very high. And I have found And the girls data. have been catching yeah. up. That's right. You used That's to get, right. uh, there wasn't so much of a difference in the attempt between boys and girls, but boys more often succeeded. Well, the, the, the general finding is that girls make many more attempts because they use reversible means and it's, uh, it's often seen not as a deliberate attempt to actually end their life, but a cry of desperation okay. and a plea. So girls yeah. in every country I've looked at, girls make many more attempts yeah. at suicide, but they usually use pills that yeah. are reversible. Boys make fewer attempts, but they tend to use guns or tall yeah. buildings, and so they're more likely to be successful. Yeah. But the rate of completion for both sexes is up, and in America at least, um, girls are closing the gap with boys yeah. because their rate is increasing so much faster. Well, as you said, now social media can be so powerful that people can be cancelled. And as we've learnt in this country, that can literally result in people taking their own lives. It's pretty yeah. profound. That's right. That is thought to be one of the reasons why teen suicide is going up mm. in many, many countries. Uh, because, look, it's hard. You know, I think of myself as fairly tough. I'm pretty good in an argument. But the times when, I've, when my reputation has been attacked publicly on social media, it's very painful yeah. in a way that I hadn't anticipated. Yeah. Uh, a reputational destruction is painful in a way that mm. is unlike anything else. And it is a reason throughout history when people have committed suicide. Mm. When your reputation is sullied, it's a common, mm. a common thing to commit suicide. Tell me, um, it would be useful, I think, for a lot of our listeners to say a little about the difference between anxiety and depression. And as I understand it, uh, anxiety is uh, something that uh, is perhaps more concentrated amongst girls, depression amongst boys. Um, not as far as I know. Anxiety and depression are related in that almost all mental disorders, almost all traits are heritable. And if you are more at risk of depression, then you're also more at risk of anxiety. One way to think about it is, is your brain set to see opportunities and go after them? Or is your brain set to see more threats and be careful about them? And neither one is really correct, although in a modern, safe society, you'll be more successful and happy if you're more set to the positive approach side. So we've known for a long time, since the 1980s, that mental health or, or, or susceptibility to depression and anxiety is highly heritable. Mm. But your genes don't determine your fate. They just say, how likely are you compared to others? When we see a whole generation shifting, we see a whole generation with suddenly much, much higher rates of depression and anxiety. That tells us that there's something in the environment um, that is changing kids. Now, the kids who are born with an immunity to it, who are born to be happy and approach-oriented, they probably are not very depressed now. They're able to handle social media. Um, but the kids who were in the middle and wouldn't have been depressed 20 years ago now are being sucked yeah. into depression and anxiety. Right. Well, just again, to go back to your very useful, let's frame this up. There's a lot to be optimistic about globally. There really is. I mean, the longevity, the tackling, I, I have a farm background, rural research, uh, and so forth. The progress we've made in feeding people, long way yeah, to go, but it's been right. incredible. We now have more obese people than we do undernourished, yeah. Yeah. which is an issue in yeah. itself. Um, and again, even in the West, there's, there's, there's so there's much to be positive about, much to be done if people see all them as challenges to be overcome rather than to be overcome by. That's right. This is a Western problem. In, in Muggeridge's famous words, we're in danger of eating ourselves out from within. Yeah. Um, and we want to try and f find positive solutions. So to come back to, again, I'm going to plug it again, I'm going to say, I think it would be terrific if every parent and intending parent, and probably their children as well, were to read this highly accessible book. I'd love to explore your, what do you call, three terrible ideas. And to read from the flyleaf, because it's a very well-written flyleaf as well, um, you say that the new problems on campus, well, let's say young people, uh, have their origins in three terrible ideas that have become increasingly woven into American, and we could add Western, really, yes, childhood out, and education. Yes. Firstly, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. And people will immediately remember the old saying used to be, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But you're saying this is one terrible idea. Mm -hmm. Always trust your feelings, which is a mantra everywhere at the moment. And life is a battle between good people and evil people. These three great untruths contradict basic psychological principles about well-being and ancient wisdom from many cultures. So that's a great start. Can we explore this idea of 
what doesn't kill you makes you weaker mm -hmm. and the notion of anti-fragile. You tell a yeah. fascinating story here <clears throat> about peanuts. Yes, this is the key idea in the book. If you don't get this idea, you won't understand what's going wrong. And if you get it, everything else seems easy and obvious. So uh, the central idea of the book, is, it comes from Nassim Taleb, uh, the guy who wrote The Black Swan. He, uh, he was trying to understand there are certain systems that um, that benefit from shock and disorder and challenge yep. and failure. Um, he, he is one of the few people who correctly called the financial crisis. He could see that our banking system had not been tested so that if anything went wrong, it was all going down. Yep. And so he's thinking about this after the financial crisis. What is the word for systems that actually need to be tested and challenged? And he comes up with the word anti-fragile because there is no word in the English language. We use the word resilient. If you ask people, say, oh, well, that's resilience. No, as he points out, um, uh, if something is fragile, it, it's gonna break if you drop it, so you have to protect it. Something that's resilient won't break, but it doesn't get better. So a plastic cup, if you drop it on the floor, doesn't break, it's resilient, but it doesn't get better from being dropped. And he mm. wants to know, what's the word for systems that have to be dropped? Now that might sound weird to your, to your viewers, but think of the immune system. That's yeah. the best example. The immune system uh, is a miracle of evolutionary engineering. It created an open system that learns about the environment, what toxins and bacteria, what threats are in the environment, and then it develops antibodies to that. If you protect your kid's immune system, if you use a lot of bacterial wipes, if you were to raise your kid in a bubble, like, oh, I don't want my kid to get sick. I want to protect my child. Since the immune system is anti-fragile, that would make the child fragile yeah. because the child would fail to develop normal uh, responses. And so uh, we opened the book with the story when, when my son Max was going into preschool, we had to go for parents orientation night and the teachers are going through the rules and they wouldn't stop talking about food issues, nuts, don't bring any peanuts, don't bring any other nuts, don't bring anything that was ever uh, you know, in a factory with nuts, don't bring anything that has the letter P in it, practically. I mean, they were insane with the anti-peanut rules. Like, what? You know, what's going on here? And as I looked into it, what we learned is that rates of peanut allergies are indeed rising. We know that. But only in countries where the medical authorities tell pregnant women, don't eat peanuts. And right there, you see the clue. So a study was done uh, by some doctors who realized that this, it looks like we're actually, our advice is backfiring. They randomly assigned about 600 women uh, who had recently given birth, who had kids who were at high elevated risk of a peanut allergy. Half of them were assigned standard advice, no peanuts, and half of them were given bags of this Israeli snack food. It's a puffed corn with a bit of peanut powder on it. it tastes like peanut butter a little bit. Give it to your three-month-old. Three-month-old will love the little things that they can dissolve in their mouths. Give them peanut powder. And guess what? Five years later, when they, they followed up on everyone, they, they looked out to make sure everyone was safe. Five years later, when they tested them, it was, I think, 17% of the kids who followed standard advice had a peanut allergy for life. They're going to have to worry every meal they eat. The kids who were exposed to peanut dust, 3%. In other words, we could nearly wipe out peanut allergies by doing the opposite of what we've been doing. And our argument in the book is it's the exact same thing with kids develop more generally. We have been massively protecting kids from bad experiences. No teasing. If, if someone teases a kid in school, that's bullying now. You can't tease someone in school. Uh, we wanna protect them from bad feelings. We wanna protect their self-esteem. We don't want them to get hurt. We don't want them to take any risks. We think we're helping them. It's just like keeping them safe from peanuts. We're weakening them. And so uh, our argument in the book is that there are two main reasons for the explosion of depression and anxiety. Number one is social media. We'll, we'll get to that because that yeah. takes a lot of discussion. The other is the massive overprotection that we began in the 1990s. When I speak about the book, I always ask, at what age were you allowed out? At what age were you allowed out without any adult supervision? And wherever I go, I did it la last night here in Sydney, and people are like, you know, someone says eight, oh, eight, I was out at six. Oh, we would play till the cows came home. Oh, it was great. You know, everyone talks about how they were out playing with their friends until the 1990s, at least in America. I think actually you're doing the same thing here. Um, we just stopped that. We felt. <gasps> If you let your kid out, they'll be abducted. If you let your kid out and they try to cross the street, they'll be hit by a car. We can't let kids cross streets uh, until they're 10 or 12. And so when we don't give kids the chance to develop normal human defenses, toughness, ability to be teased, ability to tease back, when we deny them all that, we're not helping them. We're harming their development. That's what we think happened. 
a bunch of issues to explore in there. New York, of course, is probably safer now than it was when you were growing up. It's a, the crime rate in New York is back down to what it was when my parents were young in the 1930s. Mm. Very, very little crime. And mm. then, of course, you know, everything else is safer. The, mm. you know, f- less likelihood of bricks falling off buildings, fewer cars going out of control, less alcoholism. Mm. So, yeah, life is a lot safer. Mm. But we don't trust our neighbors. Mm. We are freaked out because of the media. If, mm. someone, if a kid is harmed, we're going to hear about it on the news. So for a variety of reasons, the world gets safer and safer, mm. but we're protecting our kids more and more. And the result is damage. Interestingly, exploring this idea of a bit of gentle teasing along the way being part of the package. Uh, Australians are, are great uh, teasers, actually, traditionally. Mm-hmm. It's becoming incredibly incorrect now. That's right. You um, have that English working class tradition, yep. tradition of teasing each other. Mm. And it's, it can be fun. Um, it, it helps. Now, it can veer into bullying. So the key thing we learned about bullying is the original definitions of bullying like in the 1980s required that it be over across time. Mm. So if there's one kid harassing another, humiliating him day after day, that can lead the victim to not want to go to school. Mm. It is important to crack down on true bullying. But we have what's called concept creep, invented by my Australian friend Nick Haslam at University of Melbourne. Bullying, the, the definition of it gets lower and lower and lower to the point where if one kid says you're stupid, that's now considered bullying. Yeah. And we, you can't protect kids from every little thing. Interestingly, your fellow American Warren Farrell has written a very interesting book called The Boy Crisis. And he actually makes the point there that gentle ribbing and part of the whole sort of uh, interaction between a father and his children can help set a kid up uh, to be able to laugh at themselves and to cope with a bit of ribbing and a few setbacks in the classroom and out in the workplace. Although he draws a distinction. He says that a child will find ribbing from mum harder to cope with. Hmm. They look to mum for support and warmth and understanding. They expect dad to stimulate them and have a little bit of a go within the bounds Mm -hmm. of reason. Yeah, I haven't read the book, uh, but there are big differences in the way that boys and girls interact um, and some of them relate to the way they use language, and boys are more likely to tease and compete. Um, we have a problem in the United States in that as the, the mental health community, the psychology community, I'm a, I'm a psychologist, um, as it's sort of modernized and shifted and changed politically, there's been much more the idea that masculinity is in and of itself bad or toxic. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you know, the guidelines veer more towards, I think, how to raise a girl and I think boys don't quite fit into that. So I need to dig into that. I need to read Farrell's book. I need to read the new American Psychological Association guidelines uh, before I critique them too heavily. But yes, I think competition, ribbing, teasing are normal, healthy parts of boys' development. And if we protect them from this in the guise that, that teasing is bullying, I would guess that we're harming them overall. The reason that I raise it is that it seems to me, as I look back over my own life, which is increasingly looking like a long time now, if there have been times, and there might be people who say, well, you've never grown much, but if there have been times when I've grown and when self-reflection has been useful, frankly, it's often because people have told me, whether nicely or not, something I needed to know about myself to shake myself yeah. up. That's and, right. And that's, I would have thought, yes. the anti-fragile idea. Exactly. It, that's, that's perfectly put. There's a brand new book. I just reviewed it uh, uh, two weeks ago. It's, it'll come out in October called The Power of Bad by John Tierney, who's a science journalist, and Roy Baumeister, who's a very famous social psychologist. And they review a, an enormous area of research showing that in general, bad is stronger than good. If you have a relationship and you say one bad thing to your spouse, and you say two or three good things to your spouse, that's the ratio, you're in big trouble because bad is four or five times stronger than good on average in, in, the, in those contexts. Most importantly, bad is stronger than good as a teacher. So you can reward good behavior, you can punish bad behavior. And the research shows fairly consistently that we learn more from punishments, we learn more from setbacks and failures, and so of course you need both. And it's nicer to give rewards. Um, but if we protect kids from bad experience, from bad feedback, we're cutting off perhaps the majority of their learning. You can tell kids, um, I'll, you know, I'll give you, uh, I'll give you, a, you know, a, a nickel every time you don't burn your finger on the stove while cooking. But one time burning your stove on the finger while cooking, and bang, it's in your nervous system. You're yeah. going to be careful. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a, I think an incredibly powerful sort of point to make. But we also have corporate history, by the way, which we now want to ignore and scrub out of the system. So in the same way, you learn not to burn your finger. You don't do it again. There's a lot of things our society uh, has, uh, I think, in terms of knowledge and understanding, built up over the ages. We now want to discredit history so we lose our corporate memory as well. And I mean, what do you mean by corporate memory? What do you mean by that? Well, society, uh, the wisdom of the ages. Oh. We don't bring it forward anymore. We don't bring it to the table. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to relearn lessons that really were there for the taking simply by listening to old wisdom. Because it leads into the, the sort of second point, which is that um, always trust your feelings. Well, you know, there, there are plenty of thinkers down through the ages have said, don't trust your, think, your feelings. Mm -hmm. Think carefully and ensure that, if you like, your heart and your mind are in sync, but your mind has analysed what's true and what's not. Mm -hmm. That's right. So uh, a lot of ancient wisdom are techniques for improving your thinking. Uh, a lot of the ancients, East and West, so it's especially clear in the Buddhist tradition in, in, the, in the East and the Stoic tradition in the West, taught us that we, we have these emotions that warp and bias us. They make us more worried than we need to be. And both Buddhism and Stoicism are techniques of practice that allow a person who practices them, allow them to get some distance, some reflection, to question their initial reactions. Um, our brains are set to react too strongly. Again, because bad is stronger than good, we tend to react too fearfully. We tend to see negatives. So the ancients were very good at telling us to get past these biases. Uh, and this is a, these are important skills for young people to know. A big connection in our book is to cognitive behavioral therapy. Yes. Yep. Greg Lukianoff, the story of the book, uh, is that Greg Lukianoff, who runs the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, um, is prone to depression. And when he was treated for a suicidal depression in 2007, he learned cognitive behavioral therapy, where you learn to recognize these distortions, catastrophizing, overgeneralizing, black and white thinking, emotional reasoning which is, if I feel angry at you, you must have done something wrong. So Greg learns these techniques, and then he sees college students doing this in 2013, 2014. We'd never, he had not seen this before, but suddenly college students in America were reacting as though if this book is assigned, if the speaker comes to campus, people will be traumatized. They were catastrophizing about it. Um, so CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, is basically a way of taking the wisdom of Buddha and, and, um, uh, and Marcus Aurelius and the Stoic philosophers and learning to practice it yourself. Especially in university, we should not be telling people, hey, you feel this, I feel that, I can't tell you what to feel. No, in a classroom, you can say, you believe this, I believe this, here's my evidence for it, what's your evidence, and then you work it out. That's what critical thinking is. That's how you make progress towards the truth. And if we validate or hypervalidate feelings, if we say feelings are a guide to reality, we're harming our students' ability to make progress towards truth. Uh, John, uh, coming back to this whole question of wisdom and receiving the wisdom of the ages, if you like, the accumulated wisdom of the ages, you've made reference to some of the past uh, great <laughs> thinkers. Uh, it seems to me we live in a culture now where it's not valued. We don't teach it. We don't teach our own history. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there have been plenty of very significant leaders who have said that a people cut off their his from their history are led anywhere by the nose, mm -hmm. or at least open yeah. to being led anywhere by the nose. They don't have a sense of place, <clears throat> uh, a sense of self, and a sense of, if you like, where, where they're at. Mm -hmm. No, I, th I think that's right. Uh, and this, to me, is the essential conservative insight. Uh, when I wrote my book, The Righteous Mind, I read a lot of conservative writing, progressive writing. And Edmund Burke, in the history of the revolution in France, he has some line, he's a meditation on how, how the French, you know, they'll throw everything out and start anew. But we English, uh, the gist of it is, we, um, uh, we would not put a man to trade on his private stock of wisdom. That's the key quote. Um, we understand that an individual trying to figure things out isn't going to get very far, that you actually need to build on all that has been learned previously. And I think that's correct. I mean, you need a balance of conservatives retaining what is old and useful and progressives pushing for change. I'm very much a yin-yang sort of person. But if you think about it in that way, well, what happens when social media comes in? What happens when now young people are connected so closely to each other there's not room for connection to anything older. 
And so when I think back to my childhood, I have no idea what the ratio was, but I was in touch with things from several decades before. Yeah. I watched TV programs from the 1940s and 50s. Um, I, through my parents, I had a real sense of what life was mm. like in New York City in the 1930s. So I felt as though a lot of what came into my, to my eyes and my ears was more than 10 years old. Some of it was more than 100 years old. If you're you read Shakespeare, you read history. So it's good to have, have things coming in from all different eras. Fast forward to, to Gen Z, if they are hyper-connected to each other, then an enormous amount of what comes in is no more than a couple days old. Mm. And very little of it is more than 10 years old, especially if it's not in digital form. How could it get to them if it hasn't been mm. digitized? So I think we can say that, uh, that Gen Z, in addition to the mental health problems we've given them, this technology has given them what you might call wisdom deprivation disorder. There's an enormous hunger for meaning. And this is not just true for young people. This has been going on since at least the 1960s, 70s, 80s. The Western, Western progress, cultural change, the rise of individualism has, has left an enormous sense of emptiness. And we've been talking about this for a couple of generations. This is not new for Gen Z. Um, but I do believe that people who don't have a sense of where they fit, they don't have a sense of overarching meaning, are more vulnerable to cults to faddish ideas, uh, to stories about the cause of our problems. It's all them, it's their fault. They're the ones who, who, who we should blame. Uh, so I do think that traditions which evolve over time um, do concentrate wisdom and that any generation that stops attending, any generation that's cut off is worse off for it. This rise of individualism, um, of selfism, of the big me, as David Brooks calls it, uh, Daniel Altman traces it to the 60s, says we gave up on the meta-narratives, they're all too hard, we'd rejected uh, Judeo-Christian heritage, uh, the isms that followed communism, fascism, right. humanism, optimistic right. and pessimistic, it all let us down, so we'll just live for me now and enjoy ourselves, cheap credit, we could live pretty well, and when we ran out, we demanded more from our congressmen, and they gave it to us, and now we've got the horrendous debt problems. Um, it does seem to me that uh, the abandonment of a lot of that ancient wisdom, and you refer to it in your book, you quote uh, Solzhenitsyn, uh, and you quote uh, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, both of them powerfully arguing that if I can put it this way, the idea that I'm right and everybody else is wrong is very dangerous, that the dividing line between good and bad, good and evil, uh, it's a very dangerous thing to draw it between you and me, or on the basis of gender or sexuality or race. If we're to start being fully human, we need to recognise that dividing line crosses every human heart. And you talk about that a lot in the book. Yes. So there's two ideas in what you just said. One is the rise of individualism. And as older forms of organization that often suppressed individualism and, and brought out uh, or pulled from people more of a communal orientation, and religion would be preeminent in that, um, as those forms of organization become less important, people are still religious. In the United States, the fastest growing religious, religious designation is spiritual but not religious. Um, so as people leave formal churches that do tend to suppress or or encourage people to not think of themselves in, in the big me. Or to actually love their neighbors, which and, isn't a bad philosophy. Yeah. Um, so as, so there's, a lot, there's a lot that is good about the large, uh, the large organized religions that have dominated on, on this planet for the last few millennia. There's a lot that's good about them in that way. And so conservatives especially notice the, the gigantic inflation of the self that happens when people leave the, those forces that kind of constrict s selfishness or self-orientation. Um, I quote in the, in the Happiness Hypothesis, I quote the opening line from The Purpose Driven Life, a book yes. by an evangelical pastor, yes. Rick Warren. And, you know, it's I'm a Jewish... sold 35 million. Yeah, that's right. One of the biggest selling books in, in modern times. And I'm a Jewish atheist, but when I read the opening line of the book, it's so simple. The opening line is, it's not all about you. And the power of that line, because in a sense, a lot of us know, we sort of have a sense that like, oh yeah, like... I've been so focused on me. We, we, a lot of us know that this big inflated self is, is not good. There's something ugly about it. So I do give religion a lot of credit for having evolved ways of constraining this tendency to inflate. But with that said, of course, 
religions often reify certain ways of being that if you don't fit, there's no room for you. And so in the Western situation, especially gay people in particular, uh, certain, uh, obviously there are certain Bible passages, it would be hard to have religion maintain its, maintain its hold over us and still have a society in which everybody can flourish in ways that they, in freedoms that they need to flourish. So again, you need this balance of progressive impulses and change with conservative elements, I believe. That's one piece of it. The second piece you're alluding to is the, the, the dualism, what uh, Jonathan Sachs calls the pathological dualism. Yeah. Human beings evolved, I believe, to be tribal. We evolved in settings in which we often formed groups to compete with other groups, often violently. We are so good at doing us versus them that we invented team sports. There's no, it's, it's a huge waste of time unless you understand that it satisfies our deep, deep desires for tribal conflict. We enjoy it. Uh, so religions uh, evolved in that context as well. I believe both the religions themselves evolved culturally and our minds evolved biologically. Uh, that's the story I tell in The Righteous Mind. Uh, religions often foment a pathological dualism. Within any religion, you can have more fundamentalist sects within the religion that will play up us versus them. And then in many religions, especially Christianity, you clearly have more, uh, more loving elements that, that try to play it down, that try to be more universalistic, that preach love. So each of the major world religions is complicated. There are elements that would seem progressive. There are elements that would seem conservative. What we say in the book is that we're seeing on campuses the rapid rise of a form of identity politics that really plays up the pathological dualism. We praise the identity politics of Martin Luther King, uh, of Nelson Mandela, the identity politics that says there is injustice, uh, we appeal to our white brothers and sisters, we're all brothers and sisters, or we're all Americans, or we're all South Africans. Yeah. If you draw a larger circle around people and you humanize others, and then you appeal to their humanity, that actually works. Whereas what we see on campus is a form of identity politics, sometimes called intersectionality, where you teach people to see lots of binary dimensions. And while it's certainly true that these dimensions interact, the point that they intersect is a very valid point, but if we're encouraging people to see, to look around and say, oh, race, gender, sexual orientation, good, bad, if we're encouraging people to make more binary distinctions and to attach moral importance and emotional importance to it, there is no way through to a good point at the end. If you want to create a tolerant, diverse, multicultural society and you start preaching hate, hate these people, hate the people who are high on power, hate their, there is no promised land at the end. I don't know of any community that has embraced this kind of identity politics and then gotten to a just, equal, and peaceful place. So that's the third of the great untruths. Life is a battle between good people and evil people. In a sense, that's already built into our, our minds. And the goal of education in a modern Western society should be to downplay that, to teach mm -hmm. kids, no, don't look at the world that way. Um, don't see life that way. All of us have the potential for good mm -hmm. and evil. People make mistakes. We have to have forgiveness. We have to have due process for adjudicating when there are transgressions. Um, there has to be some some grace, some mercy. One of the areas where I think we have a real problem is in this area of forgiveness and forgetting. And they do seem to be particularly Judeo-Christian concepts, which lay very much at the, if you like, foundational instincts that built America and Britain, the great Western um, beacons of freedom. And let's face it, we're talking about a collapse in those cultures. That's what you and I have been talking about. You've been yes. warning us here yeah. in Australia. That washing of forgiveness and forgetness and forgetting out, it seems to be a real problem. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues I do have with progressives is that they instinctively go for hatred rather than forgiveness and understanding. Well, I, yeah, I wouldn't, want to, I wouldn't want to say that progressives in general go for hatred. I think what we see is that as, as the social justice movement plays out on social media and on the internet, what we see is not a cross-section, it's not the average, what we see is the most vocal progressives who have developed a form of social justice that has some real, really problematic elements to it. And so social media has facilitated a call-out culture, it makes it effortless to accuse people of racism, sexism, homophobia, and anything else. And if you're gonna call that justice, if you're gonna say justice is calling out transgression, justice is holding power to account, mm. okay, 
you can make that argument. There's some truth to that. But if you're going to have justice with no due process, you just make accusations yep. and that can destroy someone. And that's the end of it. Yep. There is no process for adjudicating truth. So there's no due process. There is no process for forgiveness. There is no way people can simply apologize and then be forgiven. Now, people go through the motions of a Maoist style formal apology, but that doesn't mean that the reputation is restored. They're still destroyed and left by the wayside. A common word now is they're canceled. They are canceled. Great. They are erased. They no longer yeah. exist. So if you have justice with no due process, uh, no forgiveness, no mercy, um, and as, as you mentioned, uh, forgetting, did you say forgetting? Mm, yeah. And no forgetting, that is a very inhumane society. There was recently an anecdote I heard, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the justice of the Supreme Court in the United States, Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, when she got married long ago, her future mother-in-law told her, she said, you know, in a marriage, it's good to be a little deaf. It's good to not hear certain things because you have to just yeah. ignore a lot. If you're gonna to live together, we're all imperfect. We all make mistakes. We all have flaws. You have to be able to live and let live. And one of my great fears is that while democracy has always been difficult, social media has made it that any flaw, and not even a flaw, anything that can be misinterpreted as a flaw will be magnified, will be prosecuted. And it's like, imagine, imagine in a marriage, if you married someone who always interpreted everything you did in the worst possible way and always called you out, it would be completely insufferable. And that's the way life is becoming in some corners of our society. Well, we should start to draw this to a close, but let me just put it to you this way. This issue of forgiveness seems to be incredibly important. I do think it's a Judeo-Christian concept. Mm -hmm. I don't see it writ large in any of the other great belief systems. I think it's been critical to Western freedom. But we've now reached the point where we're very unforgiving and social media, which we're both agreeing, you know, a wonderful tool used wisely, but it's being used very unwisely, means you can't forget now either. The very point you've just made. You make a mistake, you say something that, you know, the mob thinks is mm -hmm. unacceptable, you get cancelled. It can't mm -hmm. be forgotten. Mm -hmm. So you have neither yeah. forgiveness nor the capacity to forget and move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think that's right. I would just say that while I'm not a scholar of world religions, there are so many elements of Buddhism that are about non-judgmentalism, about love. There are a lot of similarities I found between Buddhism and, and Christianity in particular. So I, I'm not sure about your statement about other religions, although it certainly is true that in the Judeo-Christian tradition, forgiveness is extremely important. And it's the one that does, let's face it, lies at the heart of the formation of Western democracies. Yes. It's now been rejected. Mm -hmm. And yes. I think there are hard questions to be asked no, there about whether we're not paying a very big price for that yeah, projection. Th I think we are. Because if one of the most important goals, especially for progressives in recent years, is creating more tolerant, open, diverse society, Doesn't happen. That's, a goal that I, that's a goal that I support. But if you're going to do that, you darn well better preach and teach and encourage people to be more forgiving, to have a thicker skin. There are going to be a, the more diversity you have, the more misunderstandings there are going to be. That has to be the case. And if if you create, if you increase diversity while also lowering the bar for what counts as offensive, you're guaranteed eternal conflict. Well, John, thank you very much indeed. I can only say again, I think this should be on every parent's uh, Christmas present list. Um, it's brilliantly argued, brilliantly researched. It's absolutely on the money, as I see it, as we try in our own ways, in our own places to turn things around. And it's terrifically readable and accessible. So thank you very much indeed. Well, thank uh, you, John. I would just urge your viewers, uh, if you want to uh, get a taste of the book and see a variety of videos and materials you can use, go to thecoddling.com. We have a variety of materials there. Um, and otherwise, I thank you. I always enjoy talking to you. I always enjoy seeing the way you draw out ideas from my own writing and apply them to society and politics. So thanks for having me on again. Well, thanks for the contribution you've made by coming to this country and talking so openly and warning us, we take the warnings on board.